also has other kinds of safety properties. For example, the market for bullion is worldwide in scope and it's very liquid. During the last few months of 2008, while the US economy was on the verge of collapse, commodity prices fell across the board by as much as 50 or 60% in many cases. But gold fell much less and bounced back to its pre-crisis level within weeks. This was a pretty good test of the stability and resilience of an investment in gold. But we've got a more comprehensive test appearing in the next slide, figure 17. Here we list a wide range of economic and financial variables that provide danger signals for investors. It's evident that in most cases, gold produces positive returns under extreme circumstances. In the next slide, figure 18, we estimate how the return from gold is correlated with the performance of stocks or bonds when those assets are producing their most negative returns. So in this slide, you can see the final column in the table is the one I'm really talking about. That's the important one. And you see there, gold is negatively correlated with both bonds and stocks during the quarters in which they perform badly. So it tends to compensate for losses in the other two assets during these periods. So let's take together the evidence in the last two slides. We can see gold is an extremely helpful asset to include in portfolios through thick and thin. Could I have the next slide, please? When it comes to inflation, Wall Street tends to be late seeing it coming. And that's partly, as I mentioned, because of the widespread obsession with the consumer price index, which is so lacking in timeliness. While well, the price of gold has been signaling a return of inflation for quite a few years now, but it is taking Wall Street a long time to fully recognize it. Portfolio managers are beginning to seek investments with which they can protect themselves from the pernicious effects of this inflation. And the two leading candidates, of course, are gold and index-linked bonds. In the U.S., they're called TIPS, and they're indexed to the CPI. To the extent that investors can anticipate that the CPI is about to climb more rapidly, TIPS prices should be driven up. But we can see uh, to what extent that happens in the next slide, figure 19, and we find it does not, in fact, work that way. The chart demonstrates that higher returns from TIPS actually are followed by lower CPI inflation and vice versa. This result might seem extremely surprising, but it can be explained if the CPI is as inadequate a measure of inflation as I've been arguing. When inflation is actually imminent, the rise in the CPI will, is going to be a pale and late arriving reflection of it. And tips are protected against the changes in the CPI itself, but they're not protected against the full amount of inflation of which it is a reflection. Tips prices so therefore fall instead of rising. In other words, in the, in the face of inflation, they behave, behave exactly as regular treasury bonds do. Next slide, please. When investors seek a hedge against the depreciation of the dollar and its inflationary consequences, they might also consider commodity futures as another alternative to gold. Both gold and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, the GSCI, are assets that can be mixed into a portfolio and whose annual returns are inversely correlated with the performance of stocks and bonds. My next slide is figure 20, and it compares gold with the GSCI uh, in its role as a possible hedge for bond portfolios. The impact of GSCI on bond returns over a two-year period is seen if you just compare each gold gold colored bar in the chart with the green bar to the left of it. But the impact of gold is seen by comparing the two bars on the right of the chart with the two bars on the left of the chart. By this test, gold is three times better than the GSCI for hedging a bonds portfolio. The following slide is figure 21, repeating these calculations for the stock market. And again, the data show that gold is the better hedge. There's an inconsistency in the chart. The green bar is sometimes higher than the gold bar, sometimes lower. That's actually an inconsistency in the role that the GSCI plays. It, it doesn't have an inconsistently inverse correlation with stocks. Sometimes it's a positive correlation with stocks. But gold always has a consistently inverse correlation with stocks. Uh, can I have the next?
Next slide, please. When gold is added to a fixed income portfolio, it greatly improves the ratio of return to risk because bond price movements are inversely correlated with the changing price of gold. We have to allow for the fact that it takes up to two years for the impact to be fully felt, and that's shown in the next slide, figure 22. If you observe the difference, or the divergence, I should say, between the two lines, it stops widening after year number two. So we need a two-year time frame. The following slide, figure 23, looks at the portfolio's ratio of risk to return as the amount of gold in the mix varies between zero and 100%. The ratio is maximized when the percentage of gold is 21%. And that's good to know. But it's not the same thing as producing a portfolio that's immune to inflation. In fact, uh, we, can, uh, we get an even more uh, favorable result in the next slide, figure 24, we use the two-year cumulative change in the price of gold to measure the damage done by inflation to the annual performance of a T-bond portfolio. And the diagram shows the sensitivity of portfolio returns to a one percentage point change in the gold price for portfolios with different gold content. As you can see, the sensitivity it passes through the zero line, it's almost exactly zero, and it makes it 15% gold and 85% treasury bonds. I would argue that's equivalent to providing 100% protection to a bond portfolio against inflation. Uh, next slide, please. Much the same can be said about hedging an equities portfolio against inflation, although the details are a bit different. Price movements in the broad equity market are inversely correlated with gold, as shown in the next slide. That's figure 25. But in this case, the delay in response lasts several years, and that's shown by the widening divergence between the two lines. So in the following slide, figure 26, we use the five-year cumulative change in the gold price instead of the two-year change to measure the damage done to the portfolio from inflation. The diagram shows that the sensitivity of the portfolio is zero when it contains, again, 15% gold and 85% equities. It's not coincidence that this same gold component, 15%, is the right amount to immunize either a T-bond portfolio or a U.S. equity portfolio against inflation. Uh, next slide, please. Many talking heads are warning that owning gold constitutes speculation rather than investment. But there isn't really any analytical distinction. All investment involves risk, and all investment is to some extent speculative. Of course, some investment vehicles are more volatile than others. But I would say gold is only superficially a volatile asset. It seems that way because we measure its performance in terms of dollars. While it's a universal convention to express prices and investment performance in dollar terms, the conventionality of a practice is no guarantee of its validity. Fictive conventions can seriously mislead otherwise thoughtful people. The value of gold has always been recognized as extraordinarily stable in real terms. Measured in U.S. dollars, the price of gold can either be stable, as it was in the gold standard era, or unstable, as it's been since about 1970. And these days, it often jumps around from one week to the next. But year to year, it's very consistent. And that's shown in the next slide, figure 27, compassing the last 10 years. The gold price has fluctuated within quite a narrow channel around its strong upward trend. I would not agree that gold is either an inferior investment, as its detractors keep saying, or a superior investment, as some of its fans claim. At any one time, gold may be a superior or an inferior investment, or anything in between. It depends on economic conditions. Times when gold is inferior, assets that are defined by paper money contracts, such as stocks and bonds, are superior. But when gold is superior, as it is now, bonds and stocks are inferior. And my final slide illustrates the inverse connection between the two, allowing for a delay of only one year for the effect to be felt. You see in figure 28, we get impressive inverse differences in performance. How 
about the claim that gold is not a natural investment because it has no intrinsic value or, quotes, offers no income, no dividend, no earnings, end quote. Well, if you think about it, the same can be said about a treasury bill or zero coupon bond. Either of these offers return of principal plus capital gain, no income. Both of the return of principal and the capital gain are nearly certain in nominal terms. But of course, they're both uncertain in real terms. Now, what gold offers is almost exactly the converse. The return of principal plus capital gain without income, both uncertain in nominal terms, but both nearly certain in real terms. To invest in such an asset is no speculation, but it's a sure way to preserve wealth. And at this point, I'm very happy to turn the floor back to Nick. 